At a seminar on open and innovative education, Professor Nancy Law, professor in the Information and Technology Studies Division of the Faculty of Education at the University of Hong Kong, gave a keynote address titled, Bridging Learning Analytics to Learning Design Through a Pattern Language-Based Learning Design Studio. In this talk, Professor Law describes ongoing work on a project involving the University of Hong Kong, the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology, and the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. I'm trying to stay with open education and innovative education, which is a theme of the conference. So if open education and innovative education is the goal, why is it the goal and how are we going to achieve it? So I did some background work and tried to Google these two terms on Google Scholar. And I sort of copy and pasted the titles and abstracts of those top listed 20 papers into um, Wordle and get the word cloud. MOOC comes out biggest. Well, it's not surprising, isn't it? So what is open education? Well, my understanding, although I don't claim to work in that area, is that it doesn't impose any restrictions on the learner's prior qualifications to enter into particular programs. And of course, MOOCs is, although it's not as sexy as a few years ago, but still um, it is a big um, sort of enterprise now uh, in education. And in fact, although I don't think that we can say that MOOCs have um, achieved what the expected goal to be to solve all the problems of education in the world because now most people can have access. But still I think MOOC provides an important value for A, for the um, policy decision makers to actually um, care about education and invest in education, but also it provides a lot of data for us, and also because it's, it's openness, it allows us in education to actually share what we have been doing and also to try and improve what we do. So when I remove the four biggest words, MOOC, education, learning, and open, from the text, then I come up with this cloud. So then we see pedagogy coming up very prominently, which also I think can be explained because when we talk about innovative education, we are actually talking about a need for change in the way we teach. And I think open education does pose a lot of challenges to us because A, we need to cater for different kinds of learner background and also now the goal of education for people going into education could be very different. And so how do we cater for these different um, goals? And of course, when we talk about 21st century, we, we actually don't only think about content knowledge because content knowledge and skills change ever so fast. So we really lo look at more generic um, abilities of problem solving, collaboration, communication, creativity, and so on. So. That is the motivation for the project. The title of that project is an open learning design data analytics and visualization framework for e-learning. And it's a project that is funded by the Innovative Technology Fund in Hong Kong. At the time when we were writing the proposal, MOOC was big on the horizon. MOOC is one set of important um, courses and data that we work on, but we also don't confine what we do to MOOCs only. And so we want to look at developing a kind of a framework and a technology platform for learning design models and tools, and also connecting to analytical methods and also visualization interfaces 
So these are the core project members from the three institutions. At Hong Kong U, uh, a major role that we play in this project is to develop the learning design pattern language and learning design studio, which is the technology to support it. These are the key team members on this part of the project. So what is learning design? Well, actually, this term doesn't have a very long history. It probably emerged around the turn of the century. And if we look at the literature on learning design, then we see that there are several sort of key directions that people might take on it. One is actually equating learning design to instructional design. So designing learning activities on e-learning platforms mainly. So it connects with learning management systems. And then the second direction is also um, very much sort of taken up by people who are interested in teacher professional development, particularly with respect to e-learning, although not confined to it. So primarily designing for learning as a process for teacher learning. So if you sort of Google the term teacher inquiry of student learning or TISO, then you would also arrive at papers related to learning design from this perspective. And then another perspective taken is that it's learning design as an artifact, as something that can be transported or examined. And for us, our focus, we see all these three perspectives to be important, and we hope that our work contribute to all three perspectives. But our special focus is to connect learners, teachers, and instructional designers with learning analytics and visualization tools to address what we call meaningful questions. So what are meaningful questions? Well, particularly for these three groups of what we might call stakeholders. And of course, sometimes uh, if we talk about learning, say, if you use the term learning analytics, what would you think about these days? I think most times when people think about um, learning analytics, it's still very much um, to serve the institutional purpose of monitoring. And so it's basically overall um, statistics about students so-called engagement, so it's more like participation and completion and, and so on. But um, it, it doesn't go down into the learning process. In fact, there is a lack of connection between learning design or if you talk about, say, learning analytics, the term, to me, conjures up analyzing what the students are doing, what are they engaging in or what they understand or not understand during that learning process. And if we read the uh, literature, there are actually a lot of papers on that as well. But oftentimes, um, they are either about tools, or if they actually work on um, real data, most times the course data would be computer science courses. Because the people who develop these tools are computer scientists themselves, and so they work on their data, so they can make the connection. But otherwise, a lot of times, if you, you look at some of these analytical tools on other courses, there is no place where the teacher's intention is actually captured in the process. So there's no reference to that. And so then, although the analytics might tell us something about the learning process, but we are not sure how valid those interpretations are. And most importantly, it doesn't provide the kind of feedback loop that we would like to see um, to bring the learning analytics back into improving learning and improving learning design. So when we talk about learning, a lot of times we also think about teaching. So what is the teacher's role? in students' learning. This tends to be a more prominent thinking. And so if we think about MOOCs, then it is usually the lowest picture. So we evolve from the teacher talking to we see the teacher 
talking on the screen or interacting with the learning resources. Two, we don't need to be all sitting together. We can do it at our own pace and so on. But we know that this is a rather limited thinking about what the teacher can do. And when we talk about innovative teaching or innovative learning, then in fact the teacher plays a very different role. The teacher is not just standing in front of a group of students or on the screen, but actually thinking about the various learner characteristics, what they really want to learn. And of course, the teacher tends to have good content, knowledge, understanding, and the skills. So what do we want to get the students to understand? So we need to think about what are the learning outcomes, and then what kind of resources, learning support, and assessment. And we cannot make anybody learn. They have to do the learning themselves. And I think we learn through our own experiences and reflecting on those experiences. And so the learning environment is important. And the learning environment includes the physical, the digital, and the social. So how do we actually design these in order to provide the learning experiences that would be more conducive to students' learning. And so different kinds of learning outcomes probably require different kinds of learning experiences. I was talking about learning design. So what is design? When I think about design or design professionals, the kind of professions that I think about would be fashion designers, engineers, architects, right? Although I like window shopping at least for dresses, I can describe dresses that I like, but probably the kind of language I use to describe dresses I like is pretty n novice. So I can tell my friend who might uh, be interested in what I have been seeing uh, somewhere or whatever. But then to actually be able to communicate it to someone, say a tailor, to do it, or to actually communicate that design to a factory that can produce those garments, I can't do it. I don't have the design concepts. I don't have the design vocabulary. I don't have the design tools and I don't know how they work. So if we think about, say, uh, people who are designers, say fashion designers, their design should be able to be communicated to different manufacturers in different parts of the world. Likewise, if you're an architect, your drawings are not only understood by architects, but also by engineers and construction um, companies and so on. So if we think about education, we don't have a common language. If we talk about pedagogy, what is pedagogy? Can you name one pedagogy? There are lots of books and papers on pedagogy. So there are terms like prompt-based learning, scenario-based learning, and then you could have um, things like uh, collaborative learning, or you could have um, uh, flipped classrooms, or you can have, um, say, how do you get group works um, going, or designing assessment. Now, these are, to me, yes, they are valid design issues in education, but they are actually looking at design at very different levels. And we don't even have a common language talking about these different levels of design. So we feel that we need to have a language. Our work on pattern language is very much inspired by the architect Christopher Alexander. He talks about architectural design and he said, you can't just talk about designing a single building because buildings exists within a broader context. And the purpose of buildings is to serve the people who will be using it. And so he says the minimum unit that you need to be thinking about has to be at least a town. And then there needs to be a value system. And for him, buildings are 
one of the values he prizes is connecting people. Connecting people within and outside the building and connecting people to nature, to the outside world. So that defines the way that he thinks about uh, what can be designed. And also, when we think about designing, say designing a building, you have very different parts of the building. Of course, the basic infrastructure like um, the electricity and air conditioning and so on is important, but also even within a room, what is the surface uh, um, sort of materials for the room and the furniture and so on affects the people using the room. So there are very many different levels of the design. So he said a pattern language should provide a living structure to facilitate the natural flow of systemic and coherent design. And then the pattern language should also be a communication system that enables designers to articulate the design ideas and to collaborate in the construction and delivery of the designs. So we think that we need to have a pattern language that represent different levels of granularity and complexity. And so it supports the process of learning design. So we have to make explicit the design assumptions, priorities, and values. And also we need to share learning designs as specifiable products. I think now um, those of us in education are much more open to sharing and collaboration. But how do we share? One important way to share is learning resources. I can give you my PowerPoint. I can give you my lesson plan. But that, although are useful in some cases, it doesn't communicate the kind of design thinking. So we have so many good resources that we can find online, but how do we use it? That is the problem. So a learning design pattern language should guide designs to follow learning sciences-based design principles, such as empowering learners by giving them tools and resources, requiring learners to communicate and construct, promote student agency for self-directed learning, encourage sharing and collaboration, setting learning tasks that are productive and contributive, construct learning contexts that are relevant, and so on and so forth. So actually, for us as educators, learning designers, the task is actually quite complex. If you think about architects or engineers or even fashion designers, they do have tools to help them. They don't start from scratch to think about things. And they should have systems that actually guide them. So we have a lot of intelligence in designing. And we can actually use artificial intelligence, machine intelligence to help us to do so. But we don't actually have those tools. And um, according to Christopher Alexander, then a pattern language should always go from a larger structure to smaller structures, to ones that embellish those structures and then to those that embellish the embellishment. So when we think about the design, we should go from the more top level thinking about what uh, we want to achieve to lower levels. And each level there are design issues. Now I come to the pattern language. To me, if we follow Alexander's rationale, then the design should be happening at the program level, at least, right? Because a student coming into a course um, tend to be thinking about a broader set of outcomes. But that becomes a bit too complex, and it also uh, links in with more of the institutional um, sort of issues and so on. So at the moment, we start from the course. So the course is the biggest unit or the highest level. And then we have the next level as learning units and then activities and then um, further below. And we have a system of vocabularies that identifies design components at the different levels. Say, course level design, you will have learning outcomes and there would be different types of learning outcomes like disciplinary knowledge, disciplinary skills, and generic skills. And importantly, we thing that we should have a taxonomy for activities. When we talk about learning design and not teaching design, 
because we want to focus the designer on thinking about what kind of experience are we anticipating for the learner. And so we want to think about what would the activities be like for the learner from the learner's perspective. And so we find that we can sort of categorize activities into broadly four types. Uh, and we try to confine it to as small a number as possible so that we will be able to have a better grasp of how the students are experiencing it. So we have directed learning, exploratory learning, productive learning, and then reflective learning. Directed learning is basically receiving information, receiving instructions, and then it could also be practicing things and then um, being assessed. So those are all directed learning. And then exploratory learning, we have sort of defined three types. One is information exploration, so going onto the web and finding information. And then uh, exploration through conversations. So face-to-face -face conversation, online chats, um, discussion forums, and even Twitter, and so on. And then the third part would be tangible and immersive exploration. So it includes things like doing experiments and working with simulations and so on, so more exploratory. And then the third kind is more productive learning. So the students creating artifacts. So it could be tangible art artifacts. It can also be writing essays, uh, creating uh, PowerPoint presentations, and so on. The fourth type is reflective learning. And we believe that reflective learning is extremely important. So what is reflective learning? Now, of course, I can say that I'm always reflecting. Right, because I'm always thinking. But we don't know what someone is reflecting on until we see something tangible. So when we talk about reflection, then it is some artifact which is a product of the reflection. It could be, say, for example, a portfolio or journal or whatever. And then the next one would be revision. So having the opportunity to revise one's work. And then the third kind would be self or peer assessment. That's also a, a process of reflection. And so we can have, say for example, we find that in MOOCs, there's a, a very common sort of sequence um, use in MOOCs, which is you give some videos. And then so a video clip five minutes, and then another five minutes. And then um, in between, you have um, quizzes or um, and sometimes also giving them an opportunity to ask questions on the discussion forum. In some cases, they might also allow students to revise um, their answer after getting the feedback. And even at the level of a single activity, like a quiz, there can also be uh, different specifications. After talking so much about a pattern language, and with all this vocabulary, it's actually very difficult to make a language, a real language, a living language. Well, no one can have a language without at least two persons speaking the language. And in fact, two persons speaking a language would not make it a living language. The bigger the community, the more likely that the language would be, that use it would be, um, an important criteria. And why do people want to use a particular language? There must be some compelling reason. So the language must be providing some good support. And also, who wants to memorize a language? So the language has to be embedded into a tool in order for it to be a living language. So that's why we are also developing the Learning Design Studio. So we operationalize it in such a way that when someone is starting to, say, if I want to design a course, I can then be taken to a page. I would have prompts for what I need to um, enter. Now, of course, now in Hong Kong, the um, University Grants Committee um, encourages or even requires that we do outcome-based um, curriculum design. And I think that is good, that is appropriate. Because a lot of times, 
teachers tend to think about content and activities, but don't think about the learning outcome goals. Now that we have to complete the learning outcome goals on the course outline, what do we do with it? Oftentimes, that sits alone. And then we go on to activities. And how do we know which activities actually bring about what kind of learning outcomes? That doesn't need to be connected. So the interface also prompts the designer to put in learning units. And this is an interface for authoring the sequence of activities. And you can see that on the left-hand panel, you have those colored blobs. And so those color blobs would represent the 10 activity types. And then you can draw them in. So different activity sequences, we uh, form those learning units. Say, for example, uh, setting the scene probably is something that we do during the first session. And then there could be things like, say, disciplinary knowledge through um, watching videos, or it could be laboratory exercises or um, a projects or final exam. So each of these learning units, how do we define what is a learning unit? A learning unit is not the same as a session because a lot of times we design session by session. But in fact, if we think about what goes on, say if it's a 10-week course, then we need to be thinking about, okay, so what should the students be doing over the 10 weeks? Usually, say, if we give a project to students to do, we won't kickstart it right in session one. We probably st start kicking that in, session three or four, getting them to think about things, and then, so you, we, we have a kind of sequencing. So project as a learning unit has its own learning outcome goals and activity structure, which could be distributed over several sessions and so on. And some um, activities, say for example, setting the scene, well, if you really think hard about it, you might actually um, be only doing that particular activity during part of session one and so on. So after we have designed the learning units, we then um, sort of drop them into different session boxes. So even if it's a, a MOOC course, we, we, we would also have a kind of sense of how much time we expect the students to spend um, during each week. So how do we capture a learning design? This is something that we have done with our colleagues at UST. So our colleague, Professor T.C. Pong, has been teaching a very successful Java MOOC course I think he has hundreds of thousands of students who has taken that course over the past several years, and he's offered it for many times. Well, they first sit into the MOOC course, go through all the activities and so on. Here the photos are taken when they were interviewing the instructional designers at UST who's been working on the design of this course. So this is the representation of the learning outcomes and then the um, sequences and so on. So these are the activity sequences for the seven learning units. In fact, one way we try to actually validate the uh, design is our colleagues did the representation and show it to the USD colleagues and asked them for um, feedback on whether they see it to be appropriate. And I think in the main, they like it, and they find that it does provide them with uh, a different insight because we also produce a dashboard, a designer's dashboard. It's not a learning analytics dashboard. So the dashboard is uh, a tool which would actually show us the progress and information about the design that we can access even while we are designing. So say, for example, the left-hand image is to show the progress in terms of the different learning outcome goals that are being covered. It was interesting, talking about the learning outcome goals. Our colleagues um, looking at the course, they actually um, put down some generic um, outcome goals for the course. And then when they showed our colleagues, they thought, like um, sort of communication and, uh, and planning and so on. They said, well, they haven't actually thought that much about those outcome goals. They were much 
more focusing on the knowledge and skills and so on. But when they s saw the representation, they thought that actually is important. And they were very glad that we see that some of the, the activities that they design actually promote not only knowledge and skills, but also the generic skills. And then the middle panel that you see, because, say, you would have a kind of expected time spent by the students. So we have a kind of accounting for the time that we anticipate and see whether we are missing some of it and then also the time allocated to different learning outcomes. This dashboard shows the time that we expect the students to be involved in different activities. And in this case, you can see that about three quarters of the time is on directed learning. And there's also reflective learning, but not too much. So the other three types of activities, there are these three types of acti activities, but they comprise a very small proportion. So we try to differentiate the activity type from the social organization. So some of the work is individual, some of it, now you can say in a MOOC course, what do you mean by whole class? There, we are still debating, but uh, we are thinking of um, activities that everyone would be participating, like, um, say, a discussion forum, or things that are the same for everyone, the kind of activities. And we also have um, a sort of time allocated for the different learning units, so which are more important. And the dashboard also provides a view on the assessment. So the course has eight learning outcome goals. So are there assessments that address each of these learning outcome goals? Suppose you only have seven out of the eight that is covered. Of the seven uh, assessment tasks, how many of them you have built in feedback? So say suppose you have four. So there is no right or wrong. But the dashboard is giving the designer the information about what it is. And how does it connect with learning analytics? So say, for example, this particular learning sequence, this is a pattern that we see very often. So you have videos and then test assessment and so on. How do we connect learning design to learning analytics? Now, a lot of times, for us as learning designers, we don't have the language to talk to the computer scientists who do those tools. And also, even for the same two, so, and of course there are new tools coming up all the time, and even for the same two, you could actually answer different questions by different settings and so on. So we decided the pattern language should have a list of um, designers' questions. Say, for example, one designer question could be, are my students learning the knowledge? And then that has to be converted into what we call data or evidence-based questions. So do we have evidence? So the test is an evidence. So if we have that evidence, then we can ask, are they learning? So if most of them get it, then they're learning, that's fine. But if they're not, then the next question is, what might be the reason for them to not learn? Now, there could be several possible reasons. One is that the students don't have the right prior knowledge or they're not really serious in watching the videos, or actually the resource materials are poorly done. So for each of these designers' questions, we could then also convert them into evidence-based questions. Say, for example, maybe they don't have the background knowledge. How do we know? Well, do we have a prior knowledge test? We might be able to design it into the system if we have that in mind. And then in that case, we can see whether different prior knowledge actually associate with a different learning outcomes. Or if the students are not actually watching seriously, then do we have information about, say, we do have clickstream data of video watching and so on. So then we can find whether different student 
behavior patterns on watching actually associate with different uh, outcomes. And then the last part is, say, if it's it because the videos are not well done, then we might actually look at places where the students are stopping or uh, rewinding, and then say, for those who do it seriously, if they still don't get it, then there's a problem. So if we know what the problem is, then say, if it is prior knowledge, then the teacher can actually adjust the design and also advise the students. If it is the students not watching seriously, we might send a message to some of these students to advise them to watch the video again or do something else. And then if it is the video which is a problem, then we can actually feed it back to the uh, instructional designer and we can also have something that the uh, teacher can do to improve it. Then we can do a kind of a, a, a loop into connecting the learning analytics to the learning design. So um, this basically concludes the talk. And so we hope that the learning design studio would be able to scaffold good learning design practice, uh, connect to the learning analytics, and also serve as a repository for good learning designs and design patterns and tools and the collaborative platform. In fact, we are hoping that if we have the right language and the connections, then people who are designing different learning analytics tools can then say, okay, this, my tool, this tool, this setting would be able to address a particular question. Then it would help us to um, work, collaborate more productively as a community. So this ends my talk and thank you.